too early. They turn it off and mess the whole thing up. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, as I get started this morning, it's my pleasure to announce the marriage between Christian Edward Bernard of Cambridge, Ontario and Jamie Lee Madison McLeod of Cambridge, Ontario. The wedding is to take place, Lord willing, next Sunday, August 15th in Cambridge. And uh, Christian and Jamie, we are praying God's blessing upon you, not just on your wedding day, but in the many, many days and years that lie ahead. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17, verse 20. And as you turn there, I want to tell you about an experience I had this week. I was uh, waking up, and uh, as I often do, I, I like to read the news in the morning. I was reading through the headlines, and I came upon the following headline. Ontario landlord files eviction notice over tenants' vaccinated guests. Now, that should probably be a startling headline to me, but I'm just going to be like totally honest with you. I have read so many headlines about people not inviting people to their weddings and workplaces not allowing people into their workplaces. Uh, I, I kind of just glanced over it. I think mostly because I read it as Ontario Landlord Files Eviction Notice Over Tenants Unvaccinated Guests. I am daily stunned by the level of division that I see in our community, country, culture, and churches. And the issue of vaccinations is just the latest wedge that has arisen over the last 18 months. According to Pew Research in 2020, before any of us had heard the word COVID before, 66% of Canadians polled described the country as unified. Now that means there were already a 34% group of people that thought that this country was disunified, divided. But in just the last 18 months, we have added all of the following to this, to this division that we were already experiencing. How serious is COVID? How should we respond to contain it? Do we have too many restrictions, too few restrictions? Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Should there be lockdowns? Should there not be lockdowns? What's more important is, is the mental health of the younger generation more important or is the physical well-being of older generations more important? Should we be concerned about public liberty or personal liberty or public health? Like where should we place the balance? And so you would not be surprised to know that that 66% of people who thought that Canada was fairly unified before COVID hit turned to 61% in June of 2021 who now des- describe the country as divided. Because we can, we can add those items to all of the items that were already in place, right? They, they're added to items around divisions, around wealth, education, Generation, race, gender, politics, religion, rural, urban, French, English, and on and on and on. And friends, those are not just divisions that are happening out there. They're divisions that are happening in here. And it is into this backdrop of division and discord that Jesus prays a prayer that drops like a bomb. And let me give you the context of this prayer because I think the context matters here for us to understand the magnitude of what Jesus is about to pray. See, the context is the upper room discourse. The context is the last hours that Jesus has here on this earth And the context is that Jesus knows that these are the last hours that he's going to have on this earth. In fact, we start this whole discourse in John 13, 1 with Jesus, with reading John saying that Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart this world to the Father. And so he is in this room spending time with his friends and closest followers, and he has washed their feet, and he has 
ate with them and he has spoken final instructions to them and he has tried to tell them what to expect not only in the hours to come but in the days and years that will follow and then he begins to pray. First he prays for the disciples, his friends who are in there in the room with him. But then beginning in verse 20 he expands the group that he is praying for far beyond those who are already present with him. And he prays this prayer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. I, I, I started reading this passage as I prepped for this message, and I it was just like, Oh my goodness, there is so much to unpack in these three verses. The the depth and magnitude of what Jesus is praying here is, is stunning. The implications are so huge. But first I want to look at this reality that of all of the things that in that moment as Jesus was facing his own death, he could have prayed for, he prays this, that they may be one. And there can be no doubt when we read Jesus' prayer that this is true, that the unity of the church matters deeply to Jesus. Again, Jesus is very much aware of what is ahead of him. He knows what's coming. He's he's aware of how short the time is that he has left and, and what is waiting for him. But he stops to pray. He says, Father, unite them. Make them one. And do you notice who he's praying for? As I said, he's not just praying for the disciples in the room. It would be totally understandable if this was just Jesus' prayer for those men in that room. I mean, these are his closest friends. He has spent the last two and a half, three years, every hour with these men. And and they've already been bickering and fighting, right? They've already been fighting over who's going to get what position in Jesus' kingdom. Who's the greatest? They've they've just in the last few moments been fighting about who would actually betray Jesus and who would stay loyal to him until the end. But he doesn't just pray for them. It says, I don't ask for these only, but also for those who will believe... in me through their word. See, this prayer that Jesus is praying is for us. It's for our unity. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower and disciple of Jesus, in that moment, as Jesus faced the cross, he was concerned about you. And you, and you, and you, and you, the person beside you, and the person in front of you, and the person behind you, and me. Forward, as as Jesus was facing the cross, he stopped to pray for us. That's incredible. And, And not just for us, but it says, for those who will believe in me through their word. That Jesus' prayer is a prayer that there would be unity amongst all of his followers. Yes, forward church, but all of the followers of Jesus. Everyone who hears the testimony of the apostles who comes to believe that Jesus is truly the Son of God, this is a prayer for them. Everyone who believes that Jesus was fully God and fully man, that Jesus was the Messiah and the rescuer, the Savior, that he was the one who lived a perfect life 
a life that we could never live, and died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could earn the life that he alone deserved. So as he faces the cross, he prays for all of them across the centuries and across the globe. And he prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So like if your mind wasn't blown enough that Jesus was praying for you 2,000 years ago as he faced the cross, just listen to those words again that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. See, Jesus' prayer is that our unity with one another would actually reflect the unity of God, the unity of the Trinity. That's huge. Like, Jesus and the Father are literally one. That's the Trinity that... We have one God in three persons eternally coexisting in perfect relationship. The same nature, the same attributes, worthy of the same worship and obedience. That that whole idea of the Trinity, that's amongst the most mind-stretching, mind-blowing, difficult to understand, mysterious realities in the universe, right? Our heads can't comprehend it. I had somebody try and asked me to explain the Trinity to them this week, and I I did my level best. But we can't wrap our minds around the fullness of this. It took the church like 400 years to figure out how they were even going to word this. The intimacy and the togetherness and the oneness of Jesus and God the Father is what Jesus desires for his church. He wants us to experience that. And and, and it's important to understand that Jesus Jesus is praying here for our unity, not our uniformity. Because Jesus, God the Son and God the Father are one. They're one person, but they're distinct. They're distinct. And so this is not a call for all of us to look exactly the same, to be exactly the same, to, to have the same personalities, and thankfully for all of you, the same haircut. Because I can't grow a head of full hair, and I know that many of you, listen, if no one's ever told you, you can't pull off bald. But God gives us This uniqueness, we all have unique personalities and giftings and spheres of influence and backgrounds and life experiences and and roles to play. And so the church should be this wonderfully diverse place made up of all generations and races and ethnicities and socioeconomic realities. And what's interesting is that Those differences, which can be, in so many other areas, reasons to divide, when when they're understood and and where they're embraced correctly, they actually, instead of causing division, bring us together. If you want an example of that, Paul talks about this whole idea of spiritual gifting. And he talks about how, how everybody who is in Christ has been given a spiritual gift, but those gifts are unique. And there's no single person who has all the giftings. But when we come together, we collectively become the body of Christ and display Christ in a way that we can't do it on our own. So so I want to ask you this question. When we think about the unity that Jesus is praying for, how are we doing on a scale of one to ten? And let me give you some questions that might help to bring a little honesty to your answering. Do you feel a greater kinship with people who have made Jesus their Lord and Savior or with people who think the same thing that you do about a virus you didn't know existed two years ago? Do you find it easier to love people who have the same skin color on the outside 
or the same Holy Spirit living on the inside? Are you more comfortable with people who share the same politics with you or the same profession of Jesus as Lord with you? And I would encourage you, man, this is why we started in week one with search me. And pray that prayer, God search me. Where does my allegiance and identity lie? Because we're good at lying to ourselves, right? We talked about that. Now some of us, the idea of experiencing the unity that mirrors that of the Father and the Son is about as far from where we currently stand in relationship to other brothers and sisters in Christ as is possible. We have got people, some of us, who we want nothing to do with, not because of anything that has to do with anything around Jesus, but because we disagreed over the last year about wearing a piece of fabric on our face. Come on. When we divide and separate over these things, when churches have split themselves apart in the past over worship styles and translations of scripture over whether we're going to have pews and chairs in a room over the color of the carpet? Are you serious? What we, what we, what we just make so clear is that we care about those things more than we care about Jesus. That's what we make clear. When we have disconnected from fellow followers of Jesus over things that are so trivial, we say, those things are more important in my life than Christ. When we lose unity in the church, it's because something has become more important to us than Jesus. We, we would rather rally around that thing than rally around Christ. Look what he says, that they may be in us. Jesus doesn't just pray that we would be one. He prays that we might be in him. Why? Because unity with one another flows out of our unity with God. Do you know why Christians are to be united? Because we already are united. That's why we're called to be united. In the fourth chapter of his letter to the church in Ephesus, that's what Paul tells us. Look at what he writes. He says that they ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. There is already a unity there. They don't build it. They don't create it. They maintain it. Because there's one body and there's one Spirit, just as you were called to be the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. He does not tell them to be eager to become unified. He tells them to become eager to maintain the unity. How many of you have heard the saying, blood is thicker than water? Anybody heard that saying before? That is not true. Because according to the Bible, baptismal water is thicker than blood. Because we have a greater bond with those who are fellow believers than we do with family members who don't know Jesus. And I want to tell you, this is not about unifying around unity. It doesn't work. You can't unify around unity. This is not lowest common denominator unity. This is not about trying to find something, hopefully, that we can all agree on. No, th this, is, this is highest good, highest glory unity. This is unity that flows out of saying, Jesus is more important and more precious than anything else. And everything else is subservient to that. That we don't have to share everything in common because we share what is most important in common. And Jesus is of utmost importance because without Jesus, I have nothing. But with Jesus, I've got everything. 
Listen, I, I love you even if you think kale is delicious. Even if you think soccer is exciting. And even if you like country music. But we gotta understand, we gotta understand this, that what is important is not whether you see politics the same way with somebody else, it's whether you see Jesus the same way. Who you want to be prime minister, because we're gonna come up to an election year, I think that's almost inevitable at this point. So before we get to a whole nother thing we're gonna divide over, let's talk about this. Who you want to be prime minister doesn't matter in comparison to who is your king. Okay? What is most important is not the color of your skin. That's on the outside. What's important is the spirit that lives in you on the inside. What is most important is not what you believe about COVID. It's what you believe about Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you, whatever you believe about COVID... Whether you die from COVID or not, someday you're going to die. And it's not going to matter what you believed about COVID. It's going to matter what you believed about Jesus. God is not going to split the groups into those who believe something about masking and COVID over here and those who believe something about something different about masking and COVID over there. What he's going to do is he's going to split people between what have they done with Jesus? And you're going to spend eternity with people who have thought differently over, than you over the last 18 months. So you better get used to it. You can get rid of them for a little while. They're coming back, and they're not leaving. <laughs> to be a Christian is to believe that the most important thing in your life is knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, living for Jesus. When you are focused on God, then what we share in common with Christ, that allows us to, to disagree, right? This is an unbelievable thing. Like when we're, when we're focused on who Jesus is and who, who Christ is, we actually have this foundation upon which we have this solid rock that we can disagree about all sorts of other things and we can do so lovingly because what we share in common is so much more important than the things that we differ on. When we understand that our unity is blood-bought and spirit-given, we can keep the main thing, the main thing. So when we get our eyes off of that, that we get all messed up. And look what he says. Why is this so important? He says, that we ought to do this so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's why unity matters so much. The issue of unity, it's not just critical for your sake and critical for the sake of your relationships with others inside the church. It is critical for the sake of those who don't yet know Jesus. Jesus prays for our unity because it's essential to our witness. I will tell you, when the church divides, the world derides. The world laughs and the world mocks and they say, see, this whole thing is a sham. They're no different than us. When we attack other Christians, when we run other Christians down on social media, when we call people cowards because they've come to a different conviction on scripture, of what scripture teaches about what it means to submit to the government, when we call people unloving and uncaring because they've come to a different conviction on what it means to respond in obedience to Christ, the world says, see, just like us. In fact, we don't, we don't just look like the world. Oftentimes, we look worse than the world when we do it. Let me tell you, there was a conversation between a government official in the U.S. and the Nez Pierce chief, Chief Joseph. And he wanted to know from Chief Joseph, why won't you allow the missionaries to come in and speak to your people? And here is what he said. We do not want churches because they will teach us to quarrel about God. We do not want to learn that. We may quarrel with men sometimes about things on this earth, 
but we never quarrel about the Great Spirit. We do not want to learn that. How heartbreaking. You know, I think it's obvious right now, we all know this, that Christ is not physically present in the world right now. He's not visible, right? And I got to thinking, like, if you want to make, I watch a lot of superhero movies, so bear with me here. If you want to make somebody who has the power of invisibility become visible, how do you do that? Do you know what you do? You, you take something like, like flour or paint and you toss it, right? And then it gets on them and, and they show up. I know this from Scooby-Doo. This was my first spot where I've taught this. The love in the church is the paint that makes Jesus visible to the world. Listen to what he says again. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Here's the reality. Our unity and love for one another is the apologetic that changes the world. So I spent a lot of time learning about apologetics and learning how to answer people's questions on all sorts of things, and I love apologetics. It's great and it's good, but we don't figure this apologetic out. You can throw the rest out the window. Ford, if we are serious, and I mean serious, about seeing the world changed and seeing the name of Jesus raised high and seeing many people come to know Christ, then make us one will be our prayer. Before you do that, I, w- I wanna let you know, like we call this dangerous prayers for a reason. This prayer is dangerous. Praying for unity is dangerous. Why? Because it takes work. He says that they may become perfectly one. Okay, we don't start there, Right? Take some work on our behalf. Unity, yes, it's, it's something that we have. It's something that is in Christ immediately. There's this spiritual reality, but there's some work that has to go in for us to experience it in this world. There is something that takes some, not, not building, not acquiring, but maintaining. We gotta work at the Maintaining. And it means constantly thinking and remembering that I can't just think about me anymore. I gotta think about we. I gotta give up a little bit of my autonomy for the greater good of the body of Christ. It means thinking before I speak and type. And if you can't think before you type, then some of you need to get rid of Facebook. You need to get rid of Twitter. Get rid of Instagram. Do you love those things more than you love Jesus? Because Jesus loves the unity of his church. It it means forgiving, right? Like, listen, there's some conversations that need to take place between some brothers and sisters in Christ. There's some discussions, there's some phone calls that need to happen today where we go and ask for forgiveness and grant forgiveness. That's hard work, but if we're serious when we pray, make us one, that's what Jesus is gonna ask us to do. It means fighting against the stream of culture and continuing to think through a biblical lens where Jesus is at the center so we keep on pointing towards that so we point towards one another. If you let culture take take the wheel, man, we're gonna go off in a hundred different streams and we're gonna be so divided. But let me tell you something. Here's the other reason this is a dangerous prayer because a unified church is a dangerous church. Man, these three weeks, I can't think of many sections of time where I've been preaching that have been more exhausting than the last three weeks. And it's not because we're in the middle of summer and I need some vacation time. I got vacation time coming up. I'm looking forward to it, but that's not it. It's not just because the last year and a half has been an exhausting slog. That's not it either. I I know what that feels like. 
The reason these three weeks have taken it out of me is because we are in a spiritual battle. There's a battle going on. And these three prayers, man, the last three prayers, like, if we're serious about praying them, then you know what happens? Satan and his demons get real nervous. Because if God's people were to actually get serious about praying, search me and humble me and make us one, then here's what I would promise you will happen. The prisons in hell will be a lot more empty in the days to come. If we would stop turning our weapons on each other and actually pointing them at the enemy, we'd actually make an advance. I hear all sorts of people concerned about culture and fighting culture while they're fighting each other. No, just stop fighting each other. D.L. Moody said, I have never yet known the spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. I would tell you the opposite is also true. That whenever God's people take serious the call to unity and the call to love each other and the call to, to be one, the spirit of God is unleashed to work in powerful ways. Man, I've been thinking this week about my experience in church and I've been in church my whole life like literally a week after I was born. I've been in church now for 41 years. And, and, and I've got a lot of things that I'm thankful for. I've got a lot of things that I'm thankful for about the churches I've been a part of and the church I grew up in. Thankful that I grew up in a church that placed a very high value on truth. I'm, I'm thankful that I've spent my life serving so far in a denomination that takes truth seriously and holds tightly to the truths of scripture and God's word. But to our great shame, we have often placed very little value on unity. And when Jesus came to the last hours of his life, he didn't pray we would get everything right. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not trying to downplay truth. Truth matters. We should seek it and we should pursue it. But here's one thing I know. Absolutely everyone in this auditorium, listening online, listening at any point in the future, every single one of you is going to get some things wrong. You're gonna go and one day you're gonna stand before God and you're gonna be shocked at the amount of things that you were certain on that you are dead wrong on. Dead wrong on. There was only one person who never got any of it wrong. His name's Jesus. And thank God that he showed us grace and patience and gentleness and when it all boils down to it, there is only one thing that we can't afford to get wrong. Jesus. Who he is, what he's done. And if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, no matter what else we disagree on, no matter what else we differ on, we share more in common than we do differ on. When Jesus is the most important, it changes everything. Not just for us, but for the world that we are called to be on mission on to introduce Jesus to. And so let's join together now. Let's pray. And I pray that this would be our prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, we echo the words of Jesus and we say, make us one. Make us one. Lord, forgive us. We have questioned the commitment of brothers and sisters to you because they haven't seen a global health crisis the same way that we have. God, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. We have 
separated ways with brothers and sisters because they have had difference of, different opinions on, on whether or not to wear a piece of fabric over their mouth. God, help us. Father, forgive us because we have placed wealth and status, ethnic background, political affiliation as greater sources of identity and greater prizes in our life than Jesus. Father, help us to get over ourselves. Help us to take our eyes off trivial matters and turn them on Christ and make us one so that the world would know that you have sent Christ and that you love them, that you love them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.